Trending analysis on today's healthcare headlines. This is your Market Checkup. I'm Allison Southwick and I'm here today with David Williamson, healthcare analyst here at The Motley Fool. We're going to look at a couple pieces of positive news from Merck and we've got an Obamacare update. But first off, we've got some legal troubles for Glaxo and Johnson & Johnson, unrelated. Let's start with Johnson & Johnson. We're going to head over to the Department of Justice's website. Always a bad sign. They put out a press release it's today. never good. Yeah, never good. Announcing that Johnson & Johnson will pay more than $2.2 billion as part of one of the largest health care fraud settlements in U.S. history. We're dealing with a couple of charges here, accusations. The first one has to do with recommending drug uses for, um, for drugs which didn't have FDA approval. Um, what can you tell us about this? Well, I don't care how big a company you are, $2.2 billion is a large number, and it's obviously a significant number. And you would think after Johnson & Johnson, it really had a stream of bad news. It had uh, some consumer product recalls. It obviously had those hip uh, and medical device recalls, and now uh, what appears to be some scandal for Ms. Pharma Division, although uh, this has really been a long, ongoing thing with the Justice Department, so it's not completely out of the blue. Uh, the concerns are under Risperdrol and Invega primarily, uh, and you know, under the settlement, Johnson Johnson will uh, plead guilty to a single misdemeanor violation as well. Uh, the largest part of the settlement is 1.3 billion, and this comes. Uh, uh, this has to do with uh, Risperdal sales, um, and they were being essentially um, marketed off-label, which is a no-no. Doctors can prescribe drugs off-label, but drug companies can't uh, incentivize or, or, or promote these drugs for those um, indications. And so it looked like Johnson & Johnson was in incentivizing its sales reps to go and, and market it off-label, and uh, they've been slapped down because of that. All right, so the second part, or at least other, other parts of the charges, have to do with good old-fashioned kickbacks for mm -hmm. doctors. What was going on here? Well, about uh, $150 million in kick kickbacks went to Omnicare. That's the nation's largest pharmacy that dispenses to uh, nursing home patients. And this was under the, the sort of the guise of uh, education payments and, and grants and various things like that. So tried to disguise it a little bit uh, via funding. But... Um, you know, we see this all the time. Uh, unfortunately, it's not um, an unusual practice, and uh, it's you know, it looks like it's been going on here as well. So then, I guess uh, the Justice Department has made it sound like it's a pretty big deal. You said it's a lot of money. Two point two billion is not chump change. But how common is this, and how concerned should investors be with this settlement? They should not be concerned. And in fact, it is, as I just said, it's almost all too common. So this is a, a massive settlement, right? Two point two billion, but it's not even the largest of this decade, and we're only, what, three years in? Uh, in 2010, Pfizer agreed to pay uh, $2.3 billion for illegally marketing 13 drugs for off-label uses, and then uh, just last year in 2012, GlaxoSmithKline settled for $3 billion uh, for promoting uh, antidepressants for off-label use and for not disclosing a cardiovascular risk with its diabetes drug Avandia. So, um, it's not necessarily as uncommon as you would think, even in this day and age against large multinational pharmaceutical companies such as these. But at the end of the day, it shouldn't alter investors' thesis in, uh, by thesis for Johnson & Johnson. Um, this company, especially in the pharmaceuticals division primarily, is going to be driven by how can they expand prostate cancer drugs, Atega sales, what happens uh, with Invokana's launch in, in, in type 2 diabetes. It's the first in class SGLT2 drug. And also what happens with abrutinib in blood cancer. Now this is a, a product still in clinical development, but there are multi-billion in uh, blockbuster sales uh, um, uh, that people expect from this drug. So um, that's really what investors should be looking at, not this settlement. j and J's already uh, allotted all the money for this settlement away, so it shouldn't affect the financials going forward. All right, well, you mentioned Glaxo has also gotten in trouble for recommending stuff off-label, as it were, and so we're going to move on to Glaxo's newest problem. Uh, over at Reuters, they are reporting that Glaxo, the company, is probably off the hook when it comes to facing uh, charges for allegations of widespread corruption in China. And it looks like actual executives in China, if anyone, is going to take the fall. And we talked about this when the story for first broke, but can you kind of explain a bit about what these accusations are about? Sure. Now, this is in regards to the $490 million alleged bribery scheme Glaxo had implemented in China to boost 
drug sales. The company said they had no knowledge of what was happening. It was uh, a local situation, and it appears that will be potentially the case uh, if these rumors are true, which would be great news for Glaxo and their investors because given the size and scope of it, uh, it could have brought down a lot of unwanted attention and large fines from the Chinese government. And it actually sparked off an investigation really into how pharmaceutical sales are done in the company. Uh, it ended up roping in Sanofi and Chinese investigators looked at Eli Lilly, AstraZeneca, uh, Novo Nordisk. So uh, this may not be the end of uh, Chinese problems for international pharma companies, but it looks like it might not be um, a huge reorganization of how sales are done, which is really the concern. Not only would Glaxo get hit by potentially a huge penalty, but there might be a lot more restrictions or China would use this as a way to restrict the pricing premium that they that drug companies charge. So, you know, if it's isolated to just some individuals, we saw a similar thing happen with the iron ore producer Rio Tinto, it's an Australian company. It had some uh, executives who were held in China for uh, what they saw as corrupt bi business practices, but Rio Tinto itself was not uh, punished by the Chinese government. Now Reuters is calling this the most serious accusations made against a multi multinational in China in years, which corruption in China, that's really, I mean, this is really saying something. Now, Glaxo's sales plummeted after these accusations. Um, I think the article explains because hospitals just didn't want to be near the heat of this investigation. So how serious should investors take this situation? I mean, they should definitely take it seriously. It's definitely great news that Glaxo, you know, as a company isn't being blamed and just some, you know, rogue executives. But it's going to take a while to regain that trust because if hospitals are just staying away and they're switching, it's going to be a while before uh, their reputation gets repaired. And we saw uh, Ceratide sales, which is, is Advair here. This is Glaxo's top selling drug. Uh, they did $5 billion in global sales of it last year. Uh, it dropped dramatically for the quarter. And so... Um, you know, they're going to have to, 56% uh, in fact, so they're going to have to regain some trust to regain that momentum. The sales collapse there actually helped benefit a, a rival in AstraZeneca, which, which really boosted sales. And China is, it's not a huge part of any of these companies' sales yet. I, I think it's about 3.5% of Glaxo's uh, sales. So obviously not nearly as important as, say, the United States. but it's going to be a huge growth market and it's something investors need to watch and if Glaxo is permanently hampered in, in trying to, to expand sales it's going to be tough but you know I think at the end of the day they're just going to need to have good products and those will find a home with the Chinese population. All right, all right let's move on to some good news because it's been a couple couple kind of bad news stories. Both of the good pieces of good news mm -hmm. though from Merck. So uh, first up is that their new HPV vaccine is proving to be more uh, effective than previously thought and more effective than their already approved Gardasil. So how yep. much more effective? Well, so this vaccine is codenamed V503. I'm sure it will get a uh, much sexier name as soon as it gets uh, to, uh, if it gets FDA approval. Now, it's as good as Gardasil in four strains of HPV, but it's uh, adds protection against another five. So that's really a, a much better product. And, and this is seen as having blockbuster potential. Uh, Gardasil is currently a blockbuster now, and uh, a lot of uh, V503 sales will largely come at the expense of Gardasil, but uh, there are competitors out there as well. So um, it, it, it's seen as a nice win for Merck. Obviously, this isn't going to dramatically change the valuation, but um, I, I think it's, uh, you know, we, we've seen Merck's uh, R&D department going through some overhaul, so it's nice to see some success from their pipeline. All right, the second piece of news we've got, um, we're going to head over to Fierce Biotech. I'm just going to read the headline here. Merck's, quote, breakthrough hep C combo plays catch up with promising phase two results. So. Breakthrough is in quotes here. Should I interpret that as being snarky? Probably not. Uh, it, it's it's on the table. I was certainly a little snarky when you know the new R and D head was talking about uh, chasing hepatitis C because there are already so many people focusing on this next generation hepatitis C drug uh, as led by Gilead, but Johnson & Johnson's a big player, AbbVie's a huge player, Bristol-Myers Squibb is in there, so it felt like Merck was really late to a party that was already cr incredibly crowded. So. I was a little sarcastic about it as well, but you know what? The data looks pretty good. They, they just released some phase two data for MK5172 and MK8742. Now this is a protease inhibitor and an NS5A inhibitor, and together they had cure rates from 90 to 100%, and obviously it doesn't get much better than 100%. And so I, I think they could actually have a competitive combo product even if they are 
behind in development considering they're in phase two and Gilead's lead drug Sofosbuvir is uh, under FDA review right now and just got a, a huge, uh, I think it was 15 to 0 vote of confidence from the FDA advisory committee. Wow, okay. Um, so a couple of good pieces of news from Merck. Overall, what do you think about the company? Uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting. It, the hepatitis C thing actually gives Merck potentially uh, a play there because these drugs could be co-formulated into a uh, single once-a-day tablet, which would make it competitive to what Gilead's going to do with Sophos, Buvu, and Leti, Leti Posphere, and it would uh, put them ahead of AbbVie, which is going to have a, uh, a more complicated multi-drug regimen. Um, also, Merck has uh, immuno-oncology product 3475, which is similar to Bristol's uh, Nevolumab. That could be uh, potentially a really big deal. They have an Alzheimer's drug, a base inhibitor. Um, you know, I actually think Merck's pipeline, there's all this drama about how they're redoing it. They have a new R&D head, Roger Perlmutter. And, and I do think their pipeline needed some shaking up, but it's not barren. You know, you don't look at it and say, oh, man, this is a company that needs to make an acquisition. They have some potentially attractive assets in late stage development. So, you know, I think people are maybe underestimating Merck's potential right now. All right. Well, let's move on to our final story. We're going to check in on Obamacare. Now, as we learned uh, before the weekend, so it's since we were last here talking, the national online exchanges only enrolled 248 people in the first two days. We all thought it was bad. Did anyone think it was that bad? Although, look at the rate of growth, Allison. They only had two people after the first day, right? So two to 248, that's, you know, we'll get up to seven million in no time. Right? It's exponential <laughs> growth. growth. It's crazy here. It's, it's pretty bad, though. Yeah, well, uh, Bloomberg did point out that 8.6 people visited the website. Yeah, 8.6 million. And they, they want, what, seven million to sign up is, is their target with about 30% young people. Now, given the website problems, I'm sure that's not 8.6 million people um, all trying to get insurance, but but a lot of people maybe coming back and hoping for better luck. Yeah, so when you see that number, 8.6 million people visiting, I mean, does that give you hope that everything is, is that the demand is there? I mean, should we really believe it when Sibelius says the demand is there, we just need to fulfill it? You know, I think the, the traffic was larger than anticipated and that, that, among other things, gave them some problems. So I, I do think that we are seeing demand. I think the real key is just getting the website up and running. That's why only 240 eight people signed up. There are apparently tens of thousands of people in, in a so-called waiting room who filled out applications, but the system isn't fully processing them, and, and so they're not getting to the insurance companies. And so we don't really know what the enrollment data looks like. We'll have a better view about halfway through the month uh, when they release official statistics. Now, these were just notes from a meeting. They, they're not official statistics. So, uh, you know, we should take them with a grain of salt. They're, they're not exact. I, I, I think the key will be you know, following this tech surge, um, what happens by the end of November. It'll be important to get the website uh, up and running optimally, although it may take years for optimal, but at least up and running um, by the end of the month, which is the uh, deadline that the administration has set. And they, and they brought on some heavy hitters. You know, we, Larry, or Larry Ellison of Oracle was talking about how he was gonna, I have the quote here, uh, they're doing everything they can to assist uh, the contractors to make healthcare.gov a highly performant, highly reliable, and highly secure system. Uh, Google has obviously been named as pitching in as well, uh, although we don't know the amount of resources that, that company is putting towards it. Uh, Oracle was already involved in, in United Health um, is taking the lead on on the fix. So, you know, we'll see what happens, but clearly the numbers right now, not where anyone wants them to be. Right, right. It's cute how you call it that the Google's pitching in as yeah. if they're doing this for free. <laughs> no, no, they're not. They're not doing it for free. All right. Well, if you're looking for more advice and info on Obamacare, you're going to want to check out our special report. It's called Everything You Need to Know About Obamacare. You can get a copy by sending us an email to Obamacare at fool.com. That's going to do it for today. For David Williamson, I'm Allison Southwick. Thanks for watching.